Hello, everyone. Um, I thought I'd start out with just a, a little survey here. Um, who's growing seed? Great. And who has grown seed? Great. Um, for your own use? For exchange? Um, for sale, marketing, distribution? One, two? Yes. Um, do you have varieties that you maintain and work with? That's sort of what you work with, yes? Uh, and how many generations, that's plant generations, not people generations, have you grown out of seed for? Um, anybody has done it with one seed several times? Or? 10 years. 10 years. And was that a biennial or an annual? Uh, with a garlic crop. Okay, yeah. Okay. And who considers themselves in the seed growing business? Good, a few of those. Uh, and are you growing or contracting for a seed company? Is anybody doing that? No, 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 oh, one, yes. Okay, great. I'm going to um, go through what we do with some pictures and uh, why we do it, but I'm gonna go through that fairly quickly because I wanna focus more on uh, the possibilities of what you can do uh, more than just what we're doing. So we have been uh, doing some or all of these things. Oh, I was going to come with my partner and wife, Beth, um, but she wasn't able to be here, so it's, it's just me. She would add a lot, but I'll try to make up for that. Um, so all those things I mentioned, we've been doing some or all of them on some scale for 40 plus years, and we're starting our 29th season, uh, you know, focusing vocationally on growing seed, uh, but that's almost always in the context of uh, a larger farming operation doing other things as well, not specifically seed growing only. Um, and what we have done and how we have done it is probably not the way anybody else would have done it or why they would have done it. And my goal today is to share my experience and what I know about seed growing and above all to enable, encourage, and inspire you to grow seeds. Um, a little background on seed growing altogether. So until very recently, every farmer basically and gardener saved their seed because if they didn't, they didn't have anything to grow next year. And it's pretty recently in the history of agriculture that that's been outsourced to, oh yeah, outsourced to more commercial uh, <coughs> operations. So the first people to put seed in paper packets and start selling them were the Shakers. It was an intentional spiritual community. And that was about 200 years ago. Um, and that was an innovation, and they, they did it in interesting ways. They invented the seed packing machine, which is still the basis for seed packing machines today. Uh, they're very creative and innovative people. Um, but um, people getting their seeds out of bags and packets rather than from the plants, that's a pretty recent uh, thing. Um, so this whole sort of reproductive element of, of farm and the agriculture, that has kind of moved off the farm and moved out to, um, have been outsourced to commercial and, you know, supply. And much of that uh, development and maintenance of the seed in the breeding and, and keeping the seed stocks going and, and working with them, that's been outsourced either to the academic world um, or to, uh, well, yeah, or to the, to the industry uh, using, you know, modern scientific methods. And uh, so this whole taking it away from the farm and the farmer and from the actual practice of agriculture on the farm has had some real consequences 
uh, huge consequences for agricultural biodiversity because when every farmer was growing their seed and selecting it, you really had an incredible uh, amount of biodiversity because every farmer did it differently. Um, you had a stability because it was so widespread um, and it wasn't subject to whatever market trend uh, comes about. Um, for the culture of agriculture, it's something that was kind of lost. You know, it was something that was part of agriculture, was a real essential part of it, part of farming, um, and it made the farm something that was whole and unique because it had its own seed and you were going the whole system. For the quality of food, um, so <coughs> people had selected seed both for you know, the cultural aspects, but also for what nourished them, what they liked, the taste, and so on and so forth. Um, and a lot of that was lost because the uh, emphasis became, you know, profit and production. Uh, for lo local culture, color, and adaptability, um, so much of food was uh, local, um, people's taste, what they developed. Uh, and for the inner wealth enrichment and the individuality of both the farm and the farmer, because this whole experience of working with the plant and what goes into the plant from you and what comes to the you from the plant when it goes through its whole cycle and you're actually working with something uh, on a pretty deep level, um, that gets lost and a lot of the meaning or a certain type of the meaning of what we're doing gets lost with it. Okay, so in what we do, um, we're growing seed, we're doing it as a business, but we're doing it out of a, um, more than just a business interest. Um, and our, our goal and ideal is that seed growing will really come back into agriculture as part of the culture of agriculture. Um, not only just the knowledge and skills of how to do it, um, but also the, the real deep experience of what, what it means, uh, the responsibility, what it gives to you. It's a little bit like, um, you know, every time I plant a seed, it's like, and I've been planting a lot of seeds for a long time, it's still like, is this really going to grow and become a plant, <laughs> and, and it does, and it's a miracle, and it is a miracle every single time. And as you begin to um, work with the plant over time, uh, through saving the seed and replanting it, that experience becomes deeper and deeper, and um, yeah, so, um, so we're not just working for ourselves and our own operation, but we are working for the transformation of agriculture. Um, so we, we have a farm in western Nebraska. It's a dry land area. It's almost on the border of Wisconsin. Um, and we don't do just seed production. We, do, we have a raw milk dairy beef production. <coughs> and we have vegetable production, primarily CSA, but we also uh, market to uh, an online vegetable cooperative, the High Plains Food Cooperative, and farmer's market in restaurants and um, stores and direct marketing and, and all of those things. Uh, and then we have the seed business. And um, we've planned it this way because we didn't want the seed to come out of an isolated, specialized thing. We wanted it to come off the farm. We wanted it to be the natural part of the farm that enriches the farm and that the farm enriches the seed. So we, we grow everything that we grow for seed. We also <coughs> grow it for vegetables. We have that direct experience. Um, and we grow it in a larger population, and I'll be talking about populations, um, <coughs> so that we can select out of that. We're always looking at it. We have a deeper relationship to it. Um, it also becomes more adapted to us in the farm and um, yeah uh, and we're not just working with a variety of seed but we're actually working with a stable 
breeding population of a variety. And there's a big, there, there's a whole nother level there than just growing the seed. Um, and so that's all in our mind. Um, yeah, so then, like I say, the reproductive element stays on the farm. It makes the farm more of a complete cycle, a complete being. Um, we also work very much with this ideal that the farm provides what it needs out of itself. And primarily we work with that with fertility, um, but we also work with that with the seed. So the animals there, they provide the fertility. And as you will see, we do the seed and the vegetables on more of a horticultural scale. It's not a broad scale. So most of the farm is, um, is, <coughs> is in pasture, pasture and rangeland. Um, so it's only about 1%, only it's five, 540 acres, five to six acres of vegetables and seed crops. And yet the vegetables and seed are the larger part of the gross income of the farm. <laughs> um, <coughs> so, but the animals provide much more than just what they provide financially. They provide, um, yeah, they provide the fertility. They provide a whole other element on the farm, and they balance our lives. And um, yeah, okay. Okay, so um, history. I was engaged with the Seed Savers back in the 70s and 80s, was joined as a lifetime member as soon as that was available, and, and actually went to a lot of the camp outs and went and volunteered and so on. Um, now that I've gotten so busy, I haven't been doing that lately. But I, I began as a full-time sort of community market gardener in a nonprofit, a community working with adults with special needs. and. Most of my adult life, I have been doing that. Um, now, in these last 10 seasons in western Nebraska, we're not doing that, but we're trying to build it into a community farm. Uh, so most of that time, even with building up a seed business, or mail order seed business, started it as a private enterprise, but then took it into the nonprofit, and it's been working together with the nonprofit and with possibilities and synergies that that provides. So that's one of the things that may be different from, from your situation. Um, and I did formal work and training uh, with the seed companies in Switzerland and Germany. Um, and then <coughs> started the seed company, and I hadn't really intended to start a seed company, but in the end, that was the only way to keep going. I was looking at more of a cooperative. I'd been asked to do this training by Biodynamic Association, um, and I was looking at sort of what I would call the biodynamic community of farmers, trying to aid in them working together cooperatively and growing seed for one another so that there would be a biodynamic seed supply. That's the direction I thought I was going, but I ended up starting a seed company. Um, and it started as a sole proprietorship, and then as I said, um, took it into this uh, nonprofit and left it there when we moved to Nebraska, and it's still going on. Um, so we began uh, Metal Lark Hearth Farm in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska in 2010. So we're going into our ninth season, I guess it is, there. Um, and that's um, there's our logo there. So this is a picture of the farm and the landscape. It's a <coughs> dramatic climate, dramatic area, a very volatile climate. It's dry, but um, huge ranges in temperature, uh, weather fluctuations. Uh, hail Alley, uh, I think second highest hail incidence in the US. So that's, that can be very challenging for <laughs> when your seed crops are ready. And <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, these are some of the crops we work with. Um, I, I had worked on building up this, um, I and my wife, retail seed business, and we decided to go a different direction, and we've done primarily, um, primarily uh, contract seed growing for other seed companies. However, kind of because it's what we do, and we knew it, we've established again a, a seed offering online. It's metalarkarth.org. Um, 
Uh, so, but that's, um, you know, all together as a business, it's the smaller part of it. Mainly we're doing the contract growing for other seed companies. Um, so yeah, that was beet seed. This is harvesting beet seed out in the field. Uh, so we just lay down a tarp, hold the plants over, actually cut them with an uh, <coughs> electric chainsaw. Uh, found that was the most efficient way. Use a vegetable-based oil so we don't get any. Uh, and then um, just, there's the final cleaning of the beet seed. Uh, it's a rolling operation. There's actually a machine that does that, but we do it by hand there. Um, be full of stems, what rolls out at the bottom is just pretty much ready to put in packages. It's clean. Uh, it's gone through a winnowing and a screening process before that. Um, so this is uh, carrots. They're a biennial crop. Uh, we harvest them one year, select the ones for seed. So we, we have a, a large planting of carrots, a large crop of carrots. We select the best ones out for seed by whatever criteria we're selecting for that year. And then um, <coughs> Store them in the root cellar. Uh, they've been in the root cellar, so the tops are all yellow. Plant them out in the spring. That's a, like a long nursery shovel. We've got it. We've got pretty quick at putting those in. This is about as fast as somebody can walk along and make up with a shovel. Somebody sticks in two people. Um, doing two rows in the bed, bed system. Uh, okay, so there's the seed harvest. It grows up. Carrots uh, mature over a period of time, so we go in several times and harvest. Um, cabbages are another biennials. We've kind of, we've done a lot with biennials. I wouldn't recommend starting with biennials. They are challenging, especially in this climate where they don't overwinter just by themselves. Um, so this is, are stored in the root cellar and uh, some of these have been cut in the fall and they made secondary heads, which will also then go to seed. And we have a friend back there at the back who keeps our rodent population down in the root cellar. <laughs> Did everybody see that? <laughs> it makes some people very nervous. <laughs> Replanting them. Uh, yeah, these are some that have, uh, that the, they're whole heads, not, uh, yeah, again, replanting them and gonna cover them. And uh, actually we were trying, we were overing, trying to overwinter some in the protection of our leeks that are going to seed. So that's a picture, that's an experiment. That's, those are gonna grow this year, select heads. Here they are flowering. Um, yeah, that's a Chinese cabbage in the greenhouse. Uh, we left some of the best ones to go to seed there. Uh, this is lettuce uh, <coughs> that's gone to seed. We harvest the whole plants and, and, and cure it and then thresh it. And I have some lettuce seed here at the end. I would like to do a little demonstration if we have the time. Uh, so you can kind of see what happens to that after this stage. Uh, this is a sweet corn variety. This is a threshing onion seed there. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, dancing on it, yeah. Uh, this is um, doing cucumber seeds. We're cutting them open, uh, scraping out the seeds. We actually have a wet seed processor, but we were found with the cucumbers at least to work better to, uh, uh, to scrape them out. We can be a little more selective in what we get. Uh, pretty nice large seed contract for this oriental cucumber. Um, peppers, so one of the things that we do, um, because we're doing vegetables, we, we work with uh, <coughs> synergies with the vegetables and the seeds. So the peppers, um, and the tomatoes, a lot with the tomatoes. We do some fairly good sized tomato contracts for a small operation. I mean, not, not huge, but you know, we've done contracts of 25 pounds of seeds, which is a lot of tomato seeds. <laughs> uh, so, um, so we have CSA, we're in a rural area. A lot of people like to process. Uh, so the tomatoes, you can, you can squeeze them, squeeze out the seeds. I don't know if people have done this, and then you let them ferment. Uh, so we say to people, you know, with CSA, you want some processing tomatoes. Here we're going to have a, a processing party. They come, they squeeze it. We get the seeds out. <coughs> um, they take the tomatoes home and they process them. We process a lot of them. Um, some of them go to the CSA. So a huge amount of the tomatoes produce seed and um, 
and food, and uh, something that's very nice for the people in the CSA. And then a lot of that moisture is squeezed out of there, so if they cook down to a sauce a lot sooner, you've got a lot more of the solids there. And then the fermented, fermented juice, um, yeah, our cows just go crazy. They see us coming with a bucket after that, and they just come charging and running, and the boss cow chases everybody away, and the bull gets in there with her, and they clean it up in no time. <laughs> so, um, and it's a high protein. Uh, it's a little bit fermented. <laughs> Doesn't seem to bother the bull too much. Um, so this is doing the tomatoes with the uh, wet seed processor. And this is, uh, <coughs> this is when we had the 25 pounds of tomatoes. That was a real slog to get through. Um, so where our contract, I, was, I had a seed contract and I forgot and left in the hotel room. I'll try to bring it later. Um, so seeds, the <coughs> like the tomato contract, it's like $350 a pound. Uh, we try to get something in that level to really make it worth it to us. It's a fairly sweet contract. We pay a lot of attention to it. Um, and we try to turn out a very, very top quality product. Um, and it's, there's about 125,000 uh, tomato seeds in a pound. So, you know, just the economics of it, what you can do in your head. The seed company takes, puts 25 pounds or 25 seeds in a packet and sells it for $3. So, um, and like I say, those 120,000 in a pound, we're selling for 350 a pound. You start doing the math and you can say, well, you know, <laughs> you, can, you can do this, you know, breaking it down, putting it in packets, selling it, get that markup. But um, I did that. <laughs> I built it up to, you know, um, a mail order that was doing, bringing in 150,000 gross. And, um, you have to decide what you want to do. Do you want to be sitting in front of the computer? Do you want to be out in the field? Do you want to, yeah. Um, it's not, it, it's, there's a lot of factors in there <laughs> that don't make it, uh, it's something you certainly can do and a lot of people are doing this now. It's become a real thing to just start a small seed company. Um, and, and it works and it can work, but um, I did it, I'm not, and we're doing it again, but uh, there's reasons that I moved away from that. Uh, we can go into that later. Okay, so this is uh, squeezing the tomatoes by hand. Um, and uh, yeah, this is our living room. <laughs> we, we combine art and agriculture and seed growing. Uh, but those are buckets of fermenting tomatoes. They're in the window. They have about the right temperature in there and it stays warm over overnight, and um, the fermentation process goes differently depending on the temperature and so on and so forth. Um, this is garlic, uh, we're mulching the garlic field. Um, yeah. Hail, I talked about hail, there's onions underneath there. There's another seed crop off to the right. Um, yeah, the first year we grew this most beautiful crop of onion seeds. They were just about there and then the hail came. <laughs> and that was, you know, that was a big loss. <laughs> so um, when it gets to a certain stage where it's really vulnerable, when you start growing those scapes up and they can break over, we put hail cloth on and we didn't have a hail problem this year, but we do it anyway. Um, do a lot of, so, do a lot of work with screens, a lot with hand screens. We also have fanning mill and uh, a fairly high-end air, uh, aspiration air cleaner. But I end up doing a lot of it by hand anyway. When you're doing a variety and doing small amounts, um, I often find I like doing it by hand and you have less problem with contamination. It's just so hard to get those machines back to where you want them to be. So like when I'm doing a lettuce, I do a white seed, then I do something else, maybe a coal crop in there in the machine. And then I do a black seed and then I do something else. Then I come back and do another white seed lettuce and there's some black seeds in there. <laughs> you know, it's, no matter how well you clean it out. <laughs> so I don't know. Contamination is something that you need to be pretty concerned about, especially if you're trying to build a professional reputation. 
and it happens so easily. <laughs> um, this is another sweet little machine. It's a, a, a uh, lint separator, so um, screens are with separators, so if you have a stem that will go up on the end and it will go down through because it has a certain width. Uh, lint separator will separate things by length, and there's two basic uh, systems of them, and one is a, <coughs> is, is a disc with pockets in it, and so everything that's longer than that pocket is wide gets left behind. Um, and the other is an indent, <laughs> indent cylinder, uh, which goes around and it picks things up, and it picks up the seed and drops them in a trough, and the things that are longer stay underneath. This is a little one <coughs> um, that you turn by hand. This is really sweet when we were setting up uh, turtle tree seed as a as a sheltered workshop with special needs people, it's, yeah. Um, and it's actually a laboratory tester so that most of these uh, disc cleaners are these big long things with all these discs in them and it takes a long time to set them up and clean them. And you kind of want to know what you're going to set up in there before you set it all up and then maybe have to change it. So this is, you have a whole set of discs and you test it. But we just use it for a basic seed cleaner a lot. Um, it fits our scale. And I do a lot uh, with this uh, <coughs> tray, and it's kind of traditional Northern European seed cleaning. There's a lot of techniques that you can do with it. And traditionally, they're made of wood, ash wood, and they're kind of curved and shaped. But it works pretty good just with something made out of paperboard like that. And that's what I'll demonstrate at the end if we have time. Um, so there's a, here I'm just using it to hand pick. Um, I go through a process of maybe blowing and shaking to get stems and things or whatever I want out to the front or rolling. Again, that rolling process, if you have something really round like a cabbage seed or something, you can do this rolling process or you can do it the other way where you do kind of a shuffling, shaking process and all the stems come up over the end and float out. Um, it's kind of a, it's, some of the things you do are almost magical. It's, uh, um, and I really like working with these hand things, and I've trained with somebody who, was, who had spent uh, yeah, a long, long time learning and training and doing these things. So. Um, there's another that's just a seed blower, uh, fairly accurate. I do a lot of that just with hand screens, uh, and you can do this whole process of uh, creating the air coming up through. Um, but when I want to... <coughs> When I'm testing seeds particularly and I want to know exactly what I'm blowing it at and what percentage I'm taking out, it's a laboratory tester. Um, and then I do that and then a lot of times if I've blown it out and treated it a certain way before and I'm filling small packets, I run it through there before I fill the small packets just to make sure that everything is uniform and it's, um, <coughs> it's gone through the same process as the lot I tested. Um, Uh, another. <laughs> so yeah, we also, we don't do just, this is a mobile chicken house and you know, they are out there eating up the weed seeds and, and hopefully some of the seeds that might come volunteer and be a problem with cross-pollination, so on and so forth. And uh, there's our, some of our cows out there in the field. Um, yeah, and so diversity, having a, I mean, one of the wonderful things that <laughs> growing seed brings is you have all these plants that are flowering that in the kind of horticultural system we do are all mixed in with your vegetables and they bring uh, all the pollinators and all the beneficial insects and the, uh, yeah. It, when you go out there and you've got like a carrot patch and it's blooming, you, you hear it like 20 feet before you get there. It's just incredible and all you see in there. Um, so yeah. Uh, and it adds a whole nother element to the farm. Okay, and then um, we've continued in one way or another to do the kind of social work that we were doing in Camp Hill. So this is uh, working with a, a, a handicapped young man there. Um, and then uh, we do a lot with training because we're trying to grow not only seed, but seed growers. Uh, so we have a seed apprenticeship program 
Uh, and then we have seed festival, and this is like seed festival. We do a uh, harvest dance um, <coughs> again. Uh, and then we, like, the last three years, we've done a uh, biennials field day where we bring all the biennials out that we've planted uh, or stored over the winter, and people help plant them, and then we talk about that. Um, <coughs> do a, a kind of pollination blooming tour day where we look at all the flowers and talk about pollination and the biology of the plants and then a seed festival in the fall. Um, and then sometimes then in or late fall, early winter, a real professional seed growers workshop where we, uh, so we had a, we got a, a specialty crops grant from the uh, <coughs> Nebraska Department of Agriculture, one of the federal USDA block grants to uh, teach and mentor <coughs> seed growing and we that's that's done now but uh, we did a lot of these programs through that and just uh, yeah a few pictures uh, outside our front door uh, we keep our hands there in the flower and herb seeds and so on and so forth um, and do that on a small scale and that's very satisfying too and it's something that you can do that can have quite a bit of value in a very small area, even if you're just doing a, you know, very small garden. Okay, so, you can grow seeds, if you're planting seeds, you can grow seeds, you can do it, you should do it, <laughs> okay? Um, but, you know, if you wanna go into the seed growing business, yeah, try it first. <laughs> Get some experience, grow some crops and varieties you like out to seed, something you know, something you're familiar with. Um, this gives you some experience and you build some confidence. And then replant them the next season and see how it does for you. Give them to other people and have them plant them. Um, find a mentor, find, get to know somebody who's doing it. Kind of get a feel of what it's like, talk to them, what are their problems. Uh, take a seed class. You know, you've got Seed Savers Exchange here. There's, uh, I think there's kind of regular events and classes. Um, yeah, uh, Organic Seed Alliance, um, they have an incredibly, incredible conference every two years on seed with tours of seed farms, and there's quite a few places now that are doing seed growing courses. Um, so kind of look that up, and there's a lot available online now. Um, so, you know, this is Seed Savers Exchange has had this book out for a while, and it's still the very best basic book, um, you know, on seed saving. But, you know, like Oregon State University, everything's there online, too. Um, so, yeah. And then decide how you want the market, um, direct to regional sales, do you wanna do seed racks, do you wanna put out a catalog, um, do you wanna try to work with others, the regional cooperative, um, there's quite a few of those arising now and, and I think it's a very good thing. Um, they all have their challenges and benefits like with the direct sales and the uh, seed racks and things, you're getting that markup. But um, you sacrifice a lot to get that markup. <laughs> okay. Um, paper online catalog offering, contract growing for a seed company. We have gone to doing that a lot, and there's reasons for that. It's certainly the simplest. Um, but it, you have to really do it right if you want to develop that. Um, so working with another more experienced contract grower to help them fulfill and expand their contracts, that might be a really good way to start uh, because you have your mentor, you already have the market, um, <coughs> you're not trying to break into that market. Um, so contract growing. Uh, <coughs> The demand is out there, particularly for certified organic seed. That market hasn't been saturated yet. Um, there are some trends in it which will make it probably more difficult, um, and that's more in the commercialization and the importing of seed and things like that. Uh, 
Unfortunately, you'll find most of the seed company, as soon as they can find somebody who will do it cheaper, if they can get the same quality, you're done or you have to come down. Um, for the most part, we have not had to go out and look for contracts. They've come looking for us. Um, so, I mean, that, that market's really there. Um, you know, they're knocking on our door saying, can you grow this, can you grow that? But we have a history, we have a background, we've been doing it, we've been part of it, of sort of this organic seed trade, uh, or at least the smaller scale of it, almost from the beginning of it in this country. Um, and we know everybody and we'll work with people and they've worked with us, so we have that advantage already. Um, so we can kind of choose what contracts we want and we can negotiate and if we think this isn't going to work for us or you know it might not work for us we can say no um, so but there are ways to to begin like one I said is try to find somebody who's doing it talk to them see if they'll pass on something to you or help you with it um, so another way and we we do cultivate the market. We keep in contact with the seed companies, the breeders, the growers, you know, and, and get a sense of what's out there, what's needed. Um, and yeah, that's all very important part of the business of doing it. Um, so, you know, like the seed companies we grow for, we, you know, some people put reading literature in their bathroom, ours is stack of seed catalogs. <laughs> so, you know, we're, um, we're looking at the seed catalogs and, and we're pretty sure we, we kind of keep it on top of what's out there. And if a company has something that's really good and they're not offering it this year and they've offered it before and maybe they say something about it or they don't, you know, we say, okay, what's going on here? And so we'll often say, you know, why aren't you offering this? Oh, we lost our grower or we couldn't get it or so on and so forth. And then it's <laughs> like, well, are you interested in it? Um, also, if we have something that we know and it's really good, um, we'll go to a seed company and say, you should try all this here. Um, <coughs> and if you like it, we'll, we'd, we'd like to grow it. Um, yeah, so those are, those are ways of doing it. Uh, talk to seed suppliers. Um, you know, approach what you're doing with real respect for other people who are doing it. You know, I mean, don't be afraid if you're, even if you're trying to break in and you're desperate to do it, don't be afraid to negotiate or to turn down something that's really not gonna be worth it. Uh, you'll be ahead to do that. And um, if, you know, if they can get you to do it cheaper, <laughs> they will, so <laughs> for the most part. Um, you know, a good seed company cultivates the screwers too. Um, so, what you provide um, really makes a difference and if the seed company gets your lot of seed and they open it up and they look at it, they'll know right away whether they like it or not. <laughs> uh, I mean, there are things that are visible and there are things that aren't visible. But if they look it up and they say, oh, we don't have to do anything to that. We're ready to put it in a package, and that's beautiful. There's nothing, you know. Um, that's what you want. That's going to make them come back, and that's going to say, you know, when they get it from somebody else cheaper and they open it up and say, oh, <laughs> you know, that, you know that, that's how you get them coming uh, and knocking on your door, and you're not going and knocking on their door. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and to do that, you have to be meticulous, and you have to give it your priority. Um, yeah, so economic return of seed growing, um, you know, my experience is about the same as growing vegetables. Um, you may get sweet contracts, you may not, and that helps, but you may find a vegetable market that's really sweet too, temporarily maybe, uh -huh, or herb market or whatever. Um, but yeah, when I was working in Germany, there was a, uh, a kind of vegetable uh, farming enterprise. It was a kind of a company group, and they decided to do seed growing. And they had already—I mean, they were 
very exact. They already had it, knew everything about the vegetable, so they kept exact records of how much it cost, how much time, what they put into it, and they found that was the case, and I've generally found that's the case. So don't expect a whole lot more than you're going to get for growing vegetables. Um, if you go through um, the value-enhanced things of putting it in packets and selling it and putting it in racks, you have extra time and extra cost and whatnot. Um, same with food. Um, so, yeah, again, don't be afraid to negotiate or turn down contracts. Um, it's worth it to look around, to wait, to talk, to say, this is what I need, and go for that. Um, look for in, uh, economic synergies, dual seed, vegetable, animal feed crop sort of things. Um, you know, for example, uh, well, what's the farm? It's a seed farm that's the growing seed growing part of the triple divide. Uh, seed co-op, um, which they're growing for a regional, but <coughs> this farm has also been growing things for uh, contract growing. And uh, they're also doing not just seeds, but strawberries and a certain amount of vegetables and seeds. So they grow melons for seed, for instance. All the extra strawberries, they, they've set up a certified kitchen and you know they went through this whole uh, process of doing that, which there is funding for that kind of thing, uh, of making popsicles. And it's worked out very well because all the extra strawberries, the little ones and stuff that used to go to the pigs, now they go into the popsicles, all that melon that after they take the seed out go into the popsicles um yeah dried food salsa you know squash baby food uh i mean that's a that's a particular market that you have to do just right <laughs> but you know especially if you're doing in a cooperative on a larger scale and you can all work together to set up a you know a processing facility or work with the processing facility there are all kinds of synergies that can happen there, besides the biological symmetry of having all of this diversity going on the farm. Um, so yeah, build a diversified portfolio, both in seed crops and in other farm income and activities, um, because you can, you can grow the seed and you think you've done it really well. The seed company gets it and they do a pathology test and you know that's written into your contract. You don't get anything for it. <laughs> um, or, you know, for some reason or other, the germination isn't up there. So if you have got a number of different things, you're, you're balancing out your risk there. And we've had that happen. Um, you know, like a crop we'd grown before and <clears throat> we'd never had any problems, but one year, you know, it's partly with the changing climate, a hot year, the uh, harlequin Harlequin beetle moved in and we got this disease in it that we didn't know we had in it and the seed company sent it all back and we said, well, can you go back to what we grew before? And it was still fine, but yeah, so that can be a big loss if you have if you've put too much into one thing. Uh, and um, yeah, and also if you're looking at a direct a mail order or rack or something like that, you need a certain variety. You need to grow a little bit of everything and maybe more than, more than just one of every crop. And that gets very complicated. So when we were doing that, we would grow typically 50 to 100 uh, seed crops a year. Uh, now we're growing more like 10 to 15 for a contract and maybe another 20 to 25 for <clears throat> just to keep our varieties going and to be able to make our offering online and have that variety there. And some of it we're working with other growers to bring in. Um, engage in education, outreach, social activities. Um, that all brings more meaning to it. it um, yeah, uh, it, it makes it more than just something for you. It, it brings a lot of interest. Uh, it makes it a lot more meaningful. Uh, resources needed, human resources, time, knowledge, and skill. Time is a big one. So how are you gonna fit this in? And um, particularly if you're going to start a seed company, you better, depending on how you're marketing that, you better love sitting in front of your computer. 
Um, it's one of the reasons I'm really done with it in a certain sense. I mean, I do plenty of that. But, uh, also, you know, when I was so focused on vegetable production for the, you know, the community and the market and all that, it was like, no way I could get away in the summer. Once I started doing seeds, no way I could get away in the winter. <laughs> um, and so I had to get away in the summer because other people, there's a period there, you know, from when you plant things to when you begin to harvest where other people can do that. But if I wasn't there during the winter when the orders were coming in and we were cleaning the seed and filling them, things went awry and mistakes happened and it was, it's not good. Um, okay, seed stock. You know, some seed companies provide you with a seed stock. A lot of them like to do that because they know what they give you and they know what they're getting back, hopefully. <laughs> um, I, we have pretty much done our own seed stock. Again, if you've got a crop that you've worked with and the seed company wants to grow it and you've sent them trials, um, they're happy with what you do. Um, and it's also not necessarily easy for them to maintain a seed stock in the way that you can do it. Uh, that's a significant extra burden to them. So if they're confident you can do that, um, they're often happy for you to do that. <coughs> and, you know, some of our first ones, you know, they, I think it was uh, King of the North Pepper. The seed company was already selling it. We were going to grow it for them. Um, they had asked us to grow it for them, and I said, well, do you want us to send seed stock, or do you want us to use our stock? And they said, well, we've grown out your seed. It's better than what we have. Use yours. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, so, but that's a whole, you know, maintaining the seed stock and, and how you do that. And it, it's a whole thing, and, it, uh, and it's, you know, it takes a certain amount of knowledge. It's very rewarding, and... It builds something that builds your value, builds the value of the farm, builds your value to the seed company. If you can do it right, and it produces creatively new things now and then. Um, so we've also gotten seed stock from a seed company, and we've planted it, and we've gone back to them and said, you've got problems here. Uh, we're not going to grow this. We've also had seed companies say, will you grow this? And we've said, well, you know, we know who bred that. Have you talked to the breeder? No. Talk to the breeder first. Um, we would like to start out with, you know, if the breeder has it, we'd like to know that. We'd like him to know it. Um, very, very often, if, you know, if you, the, the breeders generally really appreciate you acknowledging them, and then they're ready to step in and say, well, this is my best uh, breeding stock. I want you to start with this, because they don't want somebody, you know, growing their variety, and it's, degraded somehow or another, or when you get it, it's already degraded, uh, and it comes known, and it's not, yeah. So, and it's just a basic thing of respect. Um, and we've also had companies come to us and, and say, will you grow this? And we've said, well, you know it's PVP, oh. <laughs> yeah. There are a lot of small seed companies starting up, and it's really something you can do if you're, motivated to do that, and if you're young and have a lot of energy, I encourage you to do that. Um, it's, it's got its challenges, <laughs> and there are people who are doing it very well. Um, equipment, you'll, that's one of the reasons to start out small, is to see what it takes to do it, and what you need, and what scale you want to go to, and what kind of equipment you'll need for that scale. And this is where it's very good to visit other uh, growers' farms, um, find out what they're doing and see how that would fit in for you. And equipment can be expensive. <laughs> or you can look around and find it incredibly cheap sometimes. Funds, uh, again, start out small. Um, ideally, my, you know, the more you can generate and build on what you generate, I think the better it's going to work. But um, if you really have a business plan and you know what you're doing and you're confident you can do it, uh, then you, you might consist, consider really investing and starting out that way. People do that and it can work. Uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, you can start 
doing it for yourselves, just saving seeds if you're growing vegetables, then grow them out. Uh, see how that works. See how that fits in with you. Um, yeah, nature of plant communities and populations in, re in relation to seed. So again, we try to work with a breeding population and not just think of that we're working with growing a, a seed. And the seed is part of that, but it's part of the cycle of the whole plant. And the plant is part of the cycle, or is part of a whole plant population somewhere or other. Um, and that plant population is part of a plant community. So we try to take all of those into consideration and we've tried to build all aspects of that in what we do because that's how we want to do things. Um, so uh, I'll give you an example. There's um, <coughs> Uh, an incredibly incredible gardener who decided he's a biodynamic grower, so he has this ideal that he wants everything he uses to come from the farm. He's got a small farm, it's three acres. He does a CSA, provides about 150 families. He's an extremely good gardener. He, um, he's retired now, but he wanted to have these animals in there, so he started with rabbits and then chickens and then a cow and goats. So in that three acres, he tried to build up this whole fertility system, but he also wanted to grow all his own seed, and he, he really grows good celery and celeriac. So he wanted to grow celery seed, and celery seed, you know, something, celery is something that can be subject to inbreeding depression, so you need a new pop, uh, certain population, and you want to have probably, you know, 40 plants, especially if you're doing it one generation after another. So celery, you know, it's a biennial, and it can grow especially he's in California, so, you know, he gets these big plants, and so maybe you have 40 feet of bed growing these 40 plants, you know, uh, and he end up with five to 10 pounds of seed somewhere in there. Uh, he's a really good grower, so he might end up with more towards 10 pounds. So there's 70,000 celery seeds in an ounce. Um, he's not ready to, I mean, how can he market that? So we are marketing seeds. He contacts us. Are you interested in this? Well, that's a lot more than we can market directly. So we go to seed companies, and they try it. And they say, oh, yeah, this is, this is, we like this. We want this. Can you supply it? And, and they're doing a large-scale you know, national uh, seed company with you know, 40 to 50 employees or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so we sell it to them for... Uh, I think the, our last contract was $70 an ounce. Um, so that's, you know, that's almost $1,000 a pound. So in that 40 feet of bed, I mean, he's had to, the second year devote something to that. And he's, he selected them out of his larger. Uh, but, the, you know, that's, you know, that's $100 a foot. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So just finding ways to, to, to work together. But there are... There are these things in the biology of the plant, in the biology of the plant community, you have to take into consideration and how you're going to do it. And his whole goal from the beginning was just to grow all the seed that he's, he's doing, you know, probably 110 varieties to grow it all himself. And he's, he's largely done it, except for one or two of the more challenging things like the cauliflower. Um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, so adaptations, limitations, and reproduction. Um, yeah, that, that's one of the things is the plant. The isolation, you need to think about isolation and pollination, how you can do that. There's all different ways of isolating things. Um, we can, yeah, we can go more into that. Interaction with the animal kingdom, other species, and varieties of plants, and the surrounding environment. Pollination, weeds, pests, climate, fertility, all these things, soil. I, like, we have a very alkaline soil, so that's a challenge for us, you know, 8.5 generally. Um, annuals, biennials, and perennials, they each have their own challenges and advantages. Um, timing, so yeah, there's different times for seeds than there are for vegetables. Like, a lot of our annual vegetable crops are actually biennials uh, as seed crops. So, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing because we, 
we started out focusing on biennials because I had had some training in that and we were trying to work to bring a kind of cooperative work among a group of farmers and we knew other people could grow some of the easier things and we wanted to get the seed supply out there so we just jumped into the biennials and we haven't backed off from that. Um, but yeah, it's, this is one of the things we focus on and we teach. Um, um, yeah, so also many of the seed, particularly like the biennials, uh, come from uh, a region that has a different climate and they've been adapted as vegetables very well in like temperate northern climates. But um, they're not adapted to seed crops, that's why we have to dig them up and put them in the root cellar and replant them. Um, and they may be adapted very well for a wet climate, for vegetable production, but that's a real problem with seed production. Um, and there's, there's all kinds of ways to deal with that, and some of them are very effective. Uh, and you have to decide whether it's worth doing it or not. Okay, so that's, that's more or less uh, that. Um, how much? Okay. Okay. So I, I'll just say a couple of more things. Uh, working with seeds is just, there's a lot more going on there than you would know, than there's on the surface. And um, <clears throat> when you grow seed and you plant it and you select it and then you do that and you do it for some time, it really changes. And the, my first real experience of this was when I was working in Germany and there had been three um, farmers or sort of market gardeners who had all started with a, and they were part of this sort of whole biodynamic group of growers, and they had all started with a celeriac seed and they had all started with the same seed. They'd grown it for each for 10 years separately on their different farms. So that was like five generations. So then the seed company had started as a kind of cooperative with all these. And the seeds person had planted a, a small field um, and he had planted a section in one, section in another, and another. And I stood there and looked with him and looked at it. And you could see one, two, three, very clear. And two of them had been grown by men and one by a woman. And the two that had been grown by men were like these dark green things. And the one grown by a woman was, light green and <laughs> had a totally different character, but they all were entirely different. And so it, it, you may not realize it, but it really makes a difference. And they'd all been selecting basically, looking at the roots, selecting the roots for the same quality. <laughs> uh, and I've heard so many seeds, particularly among, you know, like from indigenous people or people who <laughs> are really connected in, in a way of you know, the sensitivity and what they can sense in the seed from who has grown it. Um, so it, it's, you really build something, a relationship there, which is uh, much deeper than just your saving the seed and planting it again and again. Um, it, it changes and it's also something that's been built up in, the, in, in farming and the cultivation of plants. And you take a, a wild plant like the, like the sort of this kind of a sea kale, the brassica oleraceae, out of which cabbage comes. But it's not just cabbage. And as a wild plant, it's more or less a uniform, you know, plant out there and you look at it and you can recognize it just like you would recognize, a, you know, a ragweed or something. Um, when people started domesticating it, it brought in something entirely new. So this species turned into cabbage and all the different shapes and colors of cabbage. It turned into kale. It was more of a kale to begin with. Collards, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, kohlrabi, and a few other more obscure things. So when domestication came and you had a whole different element, which was more out of the cultural element going into it than the natural selection, it released something that brought out this incredible diversity. And you would look at, you look at your, you know, your cabbage and your Brussels spout and your kohlrabi, 
and your broccoli, and you would think those are all different crops. I mean, they're different crops, but they're the same species. And if you grow them together, they will cross all over, <laughs> and you'll get all kinds of strange things. So yeah, um, it's one of the fascinating things how that what we have as a cultural preference or taste or whatever actually goes right into the biology uh, of, of the plant. Uh, and it comes out, and that's not just, you know, well, if all we put into it is production, um, we're not going to get the same things out if we select for taste or if we have some um, liking on a more subtle level or inclination on a more subtle level. It's these inclinations that people you have that turned it into a kohlrabi rather than a cabbage. And it's basically one place, this is what they liked, and that's what it turned into. They liked the swollen stem, and another place, they liked all the leaves, and so it turned into this big rosette. And another place, they liked the buds, so it turned into broccoli or cauliflower. Yeah. OK. Um, so I hope you feel some that you've learned something, and I hope all of you will consider uh, working with seeds because it enriches uh, your own experience, and we are, the world is desperately in need of it. Um, if, if we don't tend what we have, it will be gone and we'll have something different, and it will be very different. Um, and it won't be what we have brought about. It'll be what somebody else has brought about, and we won't have the choice. Okay, questions? And I do, I do have just a little demonstration here, which I'll probably maybe set up in that little thing there. Cool. Yeah, we will uh, take time for the demo and for questions, so maybe we can do some questions real quick, and then we'll... Okay. Yeah, questions. Yes. You mentioned your biodynamic training when you were up. Was there anything that you started doing or stopped doing after that training that, that you weren't doing before? Well, before I did the training, I had just tried saving seeds for myself for the most part, and I had a lot of experiences, and uh, I learned a certain amount that way. But it, it, everything always seemed so um, uh, pressured towards just growing the vegetables and so on that I never gave the seeds the kind of attention and focus they needed. And so I wasn't always consistent or I would have problems and I wouldn't try it again. So after I did this training, and that's not just because it was biodynamic, but also, it was partly because it was biodynamic because I had taken up a task and I was not going to not do it. <laughs> so one way or another, no matter what, I was going to grow seeds. <laughs> um, and, and I've done it in all the different ways and I'm not going to stop doing it. <laughs> um, but um, I had already been, I had done a three-year training in biodynamic agriculture. So I was already pretty much familiar with the biodynamic approach, and one of the things that I had really seen as lacking, particularly in this country, in the sort of biodynamic movement and community, was that everybody was just buying their seeds from seed catalogs, and there, was, there wasn't even organic seed available. Um, and so I wanted to change that, so that's been a task. Um, you know, there's kind of two different approaches that I was introduced to. And there are kind of polarities, and biodynamics is full of polarities, so it's very interesting. And one is that the farm should produce everything it needs out of itself, so you grow your seeds that you're going to use. And the other is that, and it's kind of the um, Luther Burbank approach, is that 
things can become kind of stuck and static, and there's ways of breaking that stuckness so that you get something freed up that you can work with. And this is very much like what Luther Burbank would do. So he would take something and he would grow it in a different condition or a different environment. Um, and then you'd suddenly see all kinds of things that would allow him to uh, bring out, out something new. Um, so he said environment, environment, environment. I've probably said that word more than anybody else. That was in the 1920s. So, um, so the other approach was, um, and being trained in Switzerland, they would do this periodically with their grain crops. Like if they grew down in the valley periodically, they'd grow them high up in the Alps, and then it would bring about a certain renewal. Um, and they would feel like there was something fresh. And so seeds, you know, there's this, with open pollinated seeds, there's this, um, what do they call it? Kind of running out. Um, pardon? Well, yeah, it's that if you, if you keep that <coughs> population completely closed, uh, yeah, the genetic slump, and it'll begin to deteriorate and run out, and you'll find that that, so there have to be ways to renew it. And one of the ways to renew it was to send it out, maybe send it someplace other in the world or to growers in whole different areas, and then bring it back and maybe combine those and then see what arises out of it. So that's a real approach to breeding, to regenerate and renew something in, in your seed stock. So, yeah, so you can work with both of those. Um, so it's not that you do the one, that you have to produce everything on your farm. So there's, there's, a, real, there's a real place for sharing seed. You're sending it out, you're bringing it back. I mean, that's how so much has developed because people have, uh, I mean, we're seeds, garden seeds, particularly vegetable seeds, are so cosmopolitan. They're from all over the world. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, there, you had a question next? Yeah. Okay. So, like I said, we have been in a fairly good position because contracts for the most pretty much have come looking for us, and we don't haven't gone looking for them. And then other people have come in and asked us. You know, we talked to so and so, and they said you grew this, and can you grow it for us? Uh, so, negotiating a contract, um, having you know, have enough experience that you know what it's going to take you to grow it. Don't grow it for less than it's worth. <laughs> you to do it. If they can find somebody else to do it cheaper than you, let them. Uh, and so, uh, and then, yeah, looking for contracts, I mean, consider what you can do. Uh, make that contract uh, seed that you're growing your priority, no matter what you're doing. Uh, make sure you can fulfill that contract. and fulfill it at the best possible level you can. That's what's going to get you the contract again, get you more contracts. That's what's going to build that. Um, so negotiating for contracts, um, you know, if you say, I can't do it for that, you need to give me more, and they say, sorry, um, we have somebody else to do it cheaper, then go on to the next thing. <laughs> you don't need to. Um, and if they know what they're going to get from you and they're um, confident of that, they'll negotiate. Um, it's, it's worth more to them to negotiate and get something that's really what they need and what they can use and doesn't have problems than to buy it cheaper and have to deal with that until that seed lot runs out. <laughs> Um, so there's the two sides of it. There's one, how you negotiate with the seed company, and the other is how you fulfill that contract uh, and build your reputation. Um, and then, like I said, you know, cultivate those contracts and that outreach by saying, well, by seeing what they need, by talking to other people, 
I mean, like Southern Exposure Seed Exchange has a list of things they need growers for. They'll send you that list and say, will you grow this? Um, you know, we haven't grown for Baker Creek seeds, but they grow a lot of different things. They sell a lot of different things. And if you look at the catalog from one year to the next, you'll find a big change um, because they not too discriminating on who grows seed because they do so many different things and people will grow it and then they don't grow it the next year. So, you know, I do know people who grow for Baker's Creek and that's primarily what they do and it works really well for them. But um, it might be one of the easier ones to enter into. One because of the variety, one because you can see what they had and they're not growing it anymore and you can say you want somebody to grow that. Um, is anybody here from Baker Creek? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a lot of experience with Baker Creek. We haven't bought much from them because we can only deal with so much and we're dealing with a lot of different things. Um, but it's, uh, we've talked to them about it, we've considered it. So you can kind of, and there are a lot of small seed companies now and some of them really need to build up their, I don't know what you call it, offering or portfolio. So you can kind of see what they need and you can say, oh, this is something I can do. And you can talk to them. You know, we wouldn't, I think, make it at all if we weren't certified organic. We're certified biodynamic too. That doesn't make a whole lot of difference. But <coughs> all the other things we can do, we really don't need to be certified organic. But for the seed growing, which we send out beyond our area, we need to be certified organic to do the contracts. Um, and that's the specialty market that's real high end right now. You know, the market that gets imported from China and et cetera, or Eastern Europe, the more challenging that's going to become. But um, now's the time to move into that because we're not quite to that point yet. Um, also be aware that you can lose what you're doing in terms of going back to them the next year from one year to the next. Don't, in my experience is don't necessarily expect loyalty from who you're contracting for. And those seed companies can also go out of business and suddenly there you are. You have to look for another market and that happens. Or they can change uh, you know, manage management and the management decides, no. Nope. <laughs> yeah, that happens too, especially if there's a lot of uh, investment and financing behind that. Uh, that can make it more difficult because they have to restructure uh, because it's not making it. Um, it, I just know this, ha I know this has happened to seed growers <laughs> and it's been extremely difficult. So, you know, um, those are all things to consider and look into each company that you're thinking about. Uh, do some investigating, build a relationship, cultivate that if you want to do this or do it yourself and um, deal with all that's involved with that, starting your own. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I have a, maybe a dream of adapting, let's say I'm farming in tomatoes or, or even popular ones, you probably get one. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a very reasonable thing to do. And if you want to, they look the same to you because. Well, the tomatoes do. Yeah. Maybe the plants are because. Right. Well, you've selected probably to keep them looking the same. Um, <coughs> although, so what I would say, you know, if you're ready to do this, I don't know how much you can play around. But 
go back to your original source and then go to several other sources, grow yours, grow that, grow that, grow that, and look and see how it does for you. And if your tomatoes are, wow, and the other ones are, uh, oh, you know, that's not quite making it, or, you know, you'll find out pretty fast and you will see, you will see real differences. Yeah, so, so the adaption would be based on climate, and maybe a, a little more colder climate, but also my growing methodology. Yeah, and diseases and, uh, there's all kinds of things. And it will also maybe give you more of an idea of what selection criteria you want to go to when you compare them to what you began with, the direction they're going, do I want them to go further in that direction or less, uh, what, what's there. I mean, if you go to Seed Savers Exchange and get those, you, yeah, might, get, that's, that's you might get a whole different strain of that. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, and it might give you an idea and you say, oh, I want these, put these two together. Yeah, when, and when I started with Susan Ash was easy. Yeah, okay. Yeah, just so to get the idea. That's great. Um, and so then when you have something that's really adapted, then you, I don't know if you want to go into the business, but you can say, this is really adapted. You should try this for your northern seed or, you know. So yeah, it opens up all kinds of possibilities. Okay. Seeds for the north. So Instead. it's not, sometimes if it's okay for a harsh climate, it's okay. maybe a little bit better for other uh -huh. too. Yeah. yeah, that tends to be the case. The further north you grow them. Um, when you grow them in the south and move them to the north, that's more of a problem than when you grow them unless, in unless the north and move them to the south. You have or a very, breathe them. Like, humid, wet, you know, yeah. like they do in the south, summer, hot, <laughs> some of those diseases, that's, that's a different yeah. factor. That's a different okay. Yeah, you. Maybe you have this because I can link, but um, where the school began said this out, right, for production, um, whether that's for isolation or for harvesting and how we're going to do, like, what are the top criteria for season seed in that time? Well, it's so variable with vegetable seed, what you need and what you can do with each one. Um, you, can, you can do anything anywhere if you try hard enough. <laughs> but there's a lot of things you can do with very simple tools that either you have or you can make. It depends on what scale you want to do it. Um, so um, screens, I mean, I can show you how I can clean this even with this, this lettuce seed, even without a screen. But I put it through a screening process and it makes it a lot easier. So it comes to the point where how much easier do you need to make it? And how much do you want to invest in making it easier? And what scale are you doing it on? Um, so, I mean, the main thing that you need is experience. You need good seed. You need to try it. Um, and you will learn by experience. Um, so I would say first, you know, do it. Get the experience that other people are doing to get the training. Yeah. Um, so this is a great tool. Can you um, show the demo to me the tabletop? Or I thought I would do it over there because I'm, I'm going to do a winnowing okay. and there's some that may want to go. I have a sheet to do it on. Okay. Go over the sheet and that has a uh, something that'll catch it that goes so over and it won't make a mess. So now this is one of these plants that's growing for a brief period of time. And uh, it won't be all right at once, but it's good at after right things. So you kind of look for uh, the point where not too much is, you haven't lost too much because it's shattered. Because, you know, um, you want to get as much of that as you can, but you also don't, you want to not put them uh, 
So what we do is we cut the whole lettuce plant and um, and we cut them about what do you call it, feathering out. We just try to make the leaves about 20 percent uh, feathering out, 10 to 15 percent somewhere. In there. Uh, and so lettuce is for the most part self-pollinated. Um, and then we cut the plants, we cut the whole plant, break right down all those spots and groups. And we <coughs> lay them down in sheets, so I held it on the sheets, depending on how it's cut. And then take the four corners, tie two corners, tie the other corners, and then spin it up in the water, take it out of the field. Then we bring it in and set up a couple of boxes, set them upright in the box, and give them you know, you sleep for six weeks to here, and those seeds will continue to develop in there, and you'll put them with these plants. So we went from 40% yeah. seed to continue to Yeah, until you're probably getting 80 to 90% by the time of construction. Okay, so you have these thick plants with all the stems and leaves on them. And the threshing process I do, and I'm doing it by hand, which I almost always do. When I was working in Switzerland, they had it. Pressure feed thing. Uh, and, uh, you're on the feeder and you can stick in the flowering tops and pull it out. Mm -hmm. We did the flowering tops, that was beautiful. And you can all the speeds, so you can do it quite precisely. But uh, I lay them down and I don't want them to be too, too dry, or else if they are, I may be taken outside and let them overnight get some moisture and they just partly dry out. Because I don't, the lettuce seed, there's a lot of little stems up there at the top. So it's very good to mix with the seed and got a whole lot of it. Um, so I lay it down, hopefully with a certain amount of moisture, so that not so much the seeds can separate, so the stems will break up. But I lay them all down, the bottoms here, the tops here, all the seed tops here, and I just do this up and down until, and the seed falls out here. Until it's all falling out, take all the stems away, and then I put them through the screening process. And first screen, slide out or hardware fall. And maybe I do it, you know, a quarter inch or half inch, the seed goes through there, and then down to eighth inch. And then I have smaller screens and some slit screens and stuff. Probably not even point. <laughs> so that gives me the thresh point. And so this is. Days ago, set up, set up. Uh, I don't get around to it when they're dried out. I put them out of the boxes and tie the four corners again and hang it up <laughs> somewhere so the mice can't get to it. They might have to get around to it. This, this one is called Sprinkle Feeder. This lettuce It's kind of an ugly traditional variety of this one. Um, very, very nice.
Thank you. 